Well, I'm here with Lindsay Jones and Christina Ishmael from CAST. Thank you both for being here. Really appreciate it. Yeah, thank you for having us. To start, could you just uh, reintroduce yourself and talk about what you each do at CAST? My name is Lindsay Jones. I'm the CEO of CAST. CAST is an organization that invented universal design for learning and works across the education world to provide information, research, and expertise around designing education for variability. Wonderful. Thank you. And I'm Christina Ishmael. My pronouns are she and her. And I am one of the newest board members on CAST. Longtime fan um, and then user of UDL in my classroom, but also in all of the policy work that I've done. Wonderful. Thank you. Um, so this year we saw the release of a new national ed tech plan. Um, and so I wonder what impact do you see the NETP making on the education space? What a loaded question. Yes. <laughs> now, I am the former deputy director of the Office of Ed Tech at the U.S. Department of Education, whose charge was to draft the new National Ed Tech Plan. And um, we know that this is kind of the flagship publication that comes out of the Department of Education, kind of the call to action to think about how ed tech can be used to facilitate teaching and learning. Um, the previous version was from 2017. And then this newest one that was just released in January of 2024 uh, expands upon a lot of the, the ideas that were first uh, listed in 2016, 2017. And universal design for learning was included at that point. Um, and then it was boosted and kind of amplified in the new version as well. And so the National Ed Tech Plan calls out three digital divides. So the digital access divide, the digital use divide, and the digital design divide. And that's where we talk about the digital design divide um, being ample time and professional learning, and then also making sure that teachers and um, district leaders understand universal design for learning to help design for the margins and um, all of our learners in our classroom with their variability, which is incredible. Um, I think that this is... It's a different type of publication than previous versions of the National Ed Tech Plan. The first one came out in the, the late 90s. Um, and you can think about what was happening in our world in the late 90s. Sure. Kind of the invention of or publicly available um, internet that it would then come into the classrooms and thinking how tech would change teaching and learning. There were a lot of um, hopes and, and kind of fears at that time. Um, we've also now kind of seen that resurface after yeah. emergency remote learning and the pandemic. And my hope with this is to really kind of set the stage for approaching all of these divides, whether it's access and where we're continuing to look at not only access to connectivity and devices, but also to accessibility. Mm -hmm. uh, and then the, the digital use divide where we get students actively using the technology, not just sitting there consuming. And then what is still missing in that is the digital design, which is giving that time and that professional learning to create those learning experiences. Sure. So I think this is, it has a, it's going to have a profound impact on education if we are actively using it in that way. Sure. Yeah. Thank you. You know, obviously a big uh, conversation point in recent months, years is this blowing up of AI technology. Everyone's talking about it. Some people are excited. Some people are scared. Uh, I think just about everyone's apprehensive. Um, so how do you see, how do you see the NETP and UDL and, and perhaps other areas of focus for cast, how do they interact with AI and how do we move toward an equitable use of AI? Yeah, well, I'll start, but definitely want to yeah. open yeah. this to Christina as well. But the premise and the research behind the work of universal design for learning is pretty simple. Our brains are as different as fingerprints. Mm. And when you are an educator in a classroom and you have 30 students, you have 30 totally different brains. Mm. And so wondering and thinking about and designing intentionally first for how you're going to provide information to those brains in ways they will each understand it sure is what universal design can help you with that can feel very overwhelming as a as an educator curriculum designer or ed tech developer so i think the the fundamental thing that we've learned is that when we personalize and we use the research about brain science to help us use the networks of the brain, the learning networks, we can increase student engagement, increase student outcomes, and universal design for learning is a way to do that. Artificial intelligence gives us many opportunities to even more 
further customize learning mm. and personalize it. So that to me, the hope and the possibility there is we know we need to do that to really unlock potential in all mm -hmm. of our learners. But now we have some tools that allow us to be even more flexible in the way we design. There's many reasons to be cautious about that, mm -hmm. as we all know, algorithmic bias, the way that we use the data, what's in the data. But I'm very hopeful mm -hmm. that um, this can really help us even create a much more flexible and dynamic environment and move out of the factory model that we've been using for so long. Great. Uh, interestingly enough, I would say I've been a part of a lot of AI policy conversations in the past six months, even in 12 months, um, having led a lot of the work at the Office of Ed Tech, but now stepping out and seeing how folks are using it at the school district level, and then even thinking about state level policy and what that entails. Um, I was on a panel a couple of weeks ago where we talked about, is it really artificial intelligence or can we flip it? And is it IA, which is intelligence augmented? Mm. And I like to think about that a little bit more because we're, we're simply providing supports for people, hmm. whether it's learners in a classroom, whether it's adults. Um, I know that we've talked a lot about how are we using generative AI. I use it for a first draft of things. Um, I haven't written a first draft of something in a while <laughs> <laughs> um, because that is where my anxiety and my ADHD actually kicks in hmm. is that I see that blank page and that blinking cursor and I'm sure. like, I can't do it. I can't do it. I can't do it. Um, and so we know that that happens to a lot of our learners as well. And so if we can think about using some of these tools responsibly, safely, ethically, all of these things, um, I think it's going to benefit all of our learners in the long run. That's wonderful. Thank you. So if you were to give a sort of quick tip to districts, educators who are listening to this and are considering AI for educational use, uh, what would you tell them in, to get started? I am a former early childhood teacher. And I love to tell people to play. Mm. That is that is one of the easiest ways to get started. Oh, awesome. They may not understand all of the kind of logistics that go into a large language model and where the data is coming from and all of that. Sure. Um, but for them to even start to play with it, I think is, is the biggest entry point and the easiest entry point for folks to see. And it can be anything from personal to professional. Mm -hmm. I was doing a live demo with um, a room full of curriculum directors last week, and I showed them how I first started using it to help develop up an itinerary for my 40th birthday last year, hmm. like a very personal use to help me draft a, you know, a policy document or yeah. whatever the case may be. And so I think playing and exploring, knowing that you're not going to break it is, is a great way to get started and then also get over that fear. That's wonderful. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I would just add from the systems level. So we work a lot with the uh, special education directors, the superintendents, the curriculum directors. And I think um, our educators are more likely to play with it. They, they are asking us a lot of questions about policy and sure. concern with different types of um, means, but they also need to play with it and they need to be, because they're, they are going to be able to set some really good, clear guidance. Yeah. And I think will impact um, the educator's ability to use it. That will be where they really, I think need to create a safe environment for people to understand it because once they can see what they can do with it, sure. it's going to be something really powerful. And we also have to assume I think one of the big concerns we have is that people assume we've taught teachers how to use technology sure. and we haven't just because you own a smartphone <laughs> and you always have doesn't mean you can teach with it. Mm -hmm. I think we've got to keep that in mind in this new frontier with AI as well. Yeah, absolutely. So Christina, I wanted to follow up on, on, on what you said about playing and uh, I, I love that. It's um, you, you said you want people to understand that they're not going to break it. Yeah. I wonder about the inverse of that. A lot of the conversation's been the dangers of AI. And just playing off of that idea, will it break you? Ooh. 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 You're getting very deep right now. Um, that's a really great question. I I will say I'm an optimist at heart. Sure. Um, and so I have actually been told I may be uh, overly optimistic about the use of AI in education. I think because I've heard some really incredible stories so far mm. um, that I'm not quite as fearful and, and even just helping folks get past that. But I've also been in the ed tech space for a while now and know there is a general fear of technology in general. It's mm -hmm. not exclusive to AI. Um, yes, we have a lot of unknowns right now, especially around student data privacy and ethical uses of all of these tools. Um, however, 
Um, I, it's a, it's a tool. I keep going back to yeah. that. It's a tool that we use in our toolbox. It's like any other ed tech tool that we've had. It's, f- it's fascinating what it can do, especially in different circumstances. Um, but I think the playing is really helpful to kind of get past that. Um, I don't know. I, I, so I'm going to go back to like, I don't know how to answer that exactly. Yeah. Um, It is something I'm really aware of, though, Mm -hmm. too, how much I use it. And I mean, I I use generative AI on a daily basis now. Mm. I've never thought that I would. But helping develop anything from an email to, you know, an itinerary, like I was mentioning. And so I think if I'm I'm aware enough and thoughtful enough of it, um, I still have that human control that I'm not going to let it completely control me. And so it's a it's a balance, but it also requires a lot of intention behind it. Sure. Yeah. And actually, you know, what your question makes me think of is one of the largest battles that we fight for people with disabilities is accessibility. It's accessible assistive technology, accessible educational materials. One of the best parts of the National Ed Tech Plan is that it envisions a seamless technology system through the Mm. school that everyone can participate in. And that's the first time we've ever seen that in government policy. And it's 2024. It seems like a little late, but yeah. great. We're so happy it's here. Yeah. <laughs> but you're quite <laughs> exactly. And so I think it's a it offers some really good real examples for districts that might be struggling or educators mm-hmm. also. But if we when your question led to kind of will it break us? To me, what would break us is if we start going forward too quickly and Mm. we don't ensure it's accessible. We don't ensure it's made for everybody. What we will do, you may not, you know, you will, what we know from working with individuals with disabilities is when we design for them, we help everyone. There's hundreds Mm. of examples of that. It's many people today use captions. They don't need them. Right. I, do. I mean, they may need, but they didn't know they weren't well, designed yeah, right I for you. Right. Use them. Yeah. <laughs> They're not designed for you. People use yeah. speech to text in their cars. Okay. It wasn't designed for them, yeah. but they benefit from it. So there's great possibility here. If you build in accessibility at the front, yeah. everyone will benefit. But there's what I worry about is people won't invest in it yeah. because they'll see they won't see that really critical connection. They'll think I'm just helping a small group of people sure. and I don't have enough. Let's let's make it work for the big group of yeah. people before then we'll deal with the hard problems. Mm. That's a real that would break us. Mm. So that we Ooh. I hope we don't go that route. That's really helpful. That's great. Um I, I think that's why it's one of the reasons why I think the work y'all do is is so um exciting and important is is, you know, I was talking to to Bobby earlier. And, and, you know, speaking of that investment into accessibility, um, you know, the, the Educating All Learners Alliance recently put out a accessibility course specifically aimed at ed tech vendors. Um, and I wonder, what would you say to an ed tech vendor? Uh, you kind of mentioned it at the beginning um, or, or a, a few moments ago. Uh, what would you say to an ed tech vendor considering the possibilities of accessibility but maybe doesn't know where to start or maybe doesn't know to what extent they should be thinking about accessibility. The first thing I would say is this is going to make your product sell to even more people. Mm. It will make a bigger audience for you. If you do this, it seems like it won't, it seems like it can be an add on and we don't see enough funders supporting it, Mm -hmm. but you will increase your reach. If you build in accessibility now where to start, I think there are some really great spots that you can go to get entry into this and start to just learn about how to talk about it and think about it, but reach out Find Cast has a bunch of resources. ELA has resources. We have product certifications on Digital Promise. I think there's many ways that you can just start to kind of move forward. And one thing I would also say just quickly is working in um, disability justice for many years, a lot of people don't start because they're afraid of offending and using the wrong language or Mm. they're afraid of not creating something perfect. And I would just really caution against that. Like, Don't stop innovation for people with disabilities Mm. because you're afraid of offending them. Mm. Invite them in. That's really the place to go. Go to our disability rights organizations and ask them (laughs) for help and ask them for their opinions. And I think you will not only broaden your reach ultimately, but you'll be really proud of your product. That's wonderful. I love that. 
Uh, interestingly enough, uh, the Office of Ed Tech had a fellow last year who was a former special education teacher and came in to do a project. And she was like, I really want to focus on accessibility within ed tech. And I was like, yes, go now. And one of the, uh, one of the deliverables that she had was a convening last summer where we brought folks together, students with disabilities, adults with disabilities in the same space as ed tech developers, and even some like district leaders that are making these decisions around ed tech tools. And I don't know if we actually provide that space often enough where we have those that are most impacted, the end users yeah. talking to actual ed tech developers and saying, you know, when I use your tool, um, my screen reader can't read it. That's yeah. a problem. That yeah. means it's inaccessible to me. And so being able to have those kind of honest conversations with ed tech developers is significant. Um, I know that that's not always an option for folks. And so it's being able to, I think in a lot of the consultation and advising that I do with ed tech developers is saying, Hey, are you talking to educators? Are mm -hmm. you talking to students, you know, with the right kind of protocols in place and um, permissions to do so? But we want to hear directly from those that are your sure. end users. Like that's the whole point. Um, a lot of folks in, in tech think that they have a solution to a problem in education, but aren't talking to actual educators mm. and so, or to the learners that are most impacted. And so I would say, also make sure that there's some sort of feedback loop kind of built into the system um, that makes sure that you're hearing from your end users. Yeah, I mean, we've talked about the NETP, we've talked about AI, um, talked about a lot of things, but throughout a, a thread I've noticed is just a, a consistent idea of, hey, let's keep talking. Let's expand the circle of who we're talking to. Let's bring everyone to the table. Um, and I just noticed this that theme of communication over and over and over again. And so with all these things, you've talked about uh, what's happened this year, what's happened recently. Um, looking forward, what are some of the projects or uh, areas of focus that you all are excited about? Well, I am excited about AI and the ability to personalize. So we've got some projects we're working on with various developers to try to learn about what are the ways that that can really impact student learning and how can we start to take universal design for learning principles and apply them in AI environments really safely, mm -hmm. consciously, and to great positive impact. So I'd say that's a huge area for us. Um, we're also very interested in um, data sets, the creation of better data sets, um, and want to be talking to anybody about that, get the right voices <laughs> yeah. and the right um, information into those data sets. So I'd say those two things are really the two areas we want to try to make a difference in as we move forward. Yeah. So I get to play a cool role, I think, on the board in that I have this experience in the sector and now being able to kind of tap into the expertise that CAST has and um, having these conversations. I got to spend some time with um, members of the team the other night and just to get to know them personally um, to say, you know, like, what are the things that you've done in your past and how does that impact your work right now? Um, working with Jennifer and, and the professional learning and knowing all of the different opportunities that are available for schools to take advantage of right now. And then knowing all the work that I've done in AI policy, like where are we going to be able to have that intersection? Uh, and so I'm excited to like tag along. That, how about that? <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, Lindsay, Christina, it's been a pleasure talking to you. This has been a great conversation. Thanks so much.